Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is William Benatti. Uh, I am a partner in the JCAM Alternative Investment Fund, and I am joined by Jack Krupe, principal and founder of the JCAM Alternative Investment Fund. And also we have a very special guest, David Hansel uh, from Lucerne Capital Partners. Uh, the subject of today's uh, webinar is advanced value add strategies. Uh, so we're gonna dig in a little bit and talk more specifically about things that you can do beyond just the traditional value add, which is something like, you know, uh, renovating the units. So uh, why don't we go ahead and just jump to the next slide here. This is the, the presentation overview. So we're gonna talk about what and why on value add, why class B specifically. Um, we're gonna talk about some examples or David's gonna give an example or a case study on the fire renovation um, project that he had, a broken condo deal a hotel uh, that they converted to multifamily. And then Jack's gonna share a little bit about the funds of funds model, which is the primary strategy for the JCAM fund, uh, the value add and cash flow, And then we'll uh, summarize it and get everybody on their way for today. Uh, so why don't we just start out with a little color on our backgrounds, Jack. Um, for those of you who don't know Jack, why don't you go ahead and fill, fill everybody in on that. Sure. So I've been in uh, in real estate for uh, 20 years at this point. Uh, you know, started out uh, you know more traditional, flipping houses. Uh, I had my broker's license at one point, and then in 2008, uh, during the financial crisis, uh, I joined a private equity fund that was buying distressed loans. And uh, so from from the start of the financial crisis through um, you know through currently. Uh, uh, bought um, a significant amount of non-performing and performing loans. Uh, we merged the private equity fund in 2015 and did uh, over $3 billion in purchases through uh, PRP advisors. Um, I left that firm in 2019 and uh, all the while I'd been investing passively in syndication deals. So now that I'm, uh, um, you know, well, I left, uh, left the company and started my own company. I really wanted to provide uh, a firm that provided both diversification and then access to these types of deals, which always performed uh, for, for me you know, better than, than other stock market type investments or REITs. So um, I also did a, my uh, dual MBA through Kellogg. So I, I've uh, you know, got a, a ton of experience and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, providing uh, some information with David today. Awesome, Jack, thanks for sharing. Uh, guys, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. I have a degree in finance and real estate from Colorado State University. I grew up in Colorado, um, did a bunch of work in the insurance business, uh, was in banking, retail banking, uh, and then was a financial advisor for, for a few years. Um, and then I transitioned into investing into uh, real estate personally, started like a lot of retail investors do. Uh, by wholesaling, doing picks and flips, uh, building out a rental portfolio. Um, and then I came across non-performing loans um, just by networking and getting to know the, the, um, the business a little bit more. And that really resonated with me uh, based on my background in, in banking and insurance. Um, and so then I, I spent a bunch of time building out a portfolio of non-performing loans and working through those. And in the process of doing that, uh, I actually moved to uh, the East Coast and was in, in New York City and I connected with Jack Krupe um, and uh, ended up having an opportunity to join his his firm and run the trade desk there uh, and was there for a couple of years uh, and then Jack and I have just stayed connected and um, you know and we're able to partner up on on this particular particular fund so that's a, a good background on me David why don't uh, why don't you share with everybody a little bit about uh, your story and, your, and some color on you? Yeah, first off, thank you very much, guys, for having me on. I've known Jack and William for many years. Jack, pretty close and um, really brilliant guy and incredible what you you guys have accomplished um, outside of JCAM and excited to see you continue to grow and do what you're doing now. Um, so my background, not too dissimilar, I've been in the real estate space for over 20 years, started in the real estate brokerage business. And during the early years in the 2000s, started investing, uh, doing some fix and flip, um, got involved in some new construction, met my partner, Mark Colazzo. And in 07, we launched a private lending company called Alpha Funding Solutions. Um, 
we built that to be one of the preeminent private lending or hard money lending companies in the Northeast um, uh, and took that company from, you know, kind of mom and pop grew it to doing over a hundred million a year in short term uh, bridge loans. We, um, we did a sale merger on that company about uh, almost two years ago. And while we were running the company, Mark and I joined forces with Frank Forte, who's our, the third partner in Lucerne Capital. Um, the goal of Lucerne was not to lend money, but to own and manage real estate. Um, we had continued to invest for our own portfolio over the years, and we saw as an opportunity, not only for us, but for the investors that had joined us in Alpha, um, that wanted to have exposure to ownership in real estate. And our focus has been primarily on value add multifamily and mixed use, and we'll get into it, but we really enjoy the uh, excitement and, and the nooks and crannies, would you say, of, of value add real estate, because it comes in a lot of different flavors. And we've really excelled and, and are very active both in Philadelphia and in Charlotte. Um, we have incredible resources and we had recently launched a fun vehicle as well um, that allows investors to to uh, back our strategy and partner in with us. Awesome, David. Thanks for sharing. Did you want to talk a little bit more about the, the Lucerne Value Fund? Um, sure. So uh, up until October, when we launched the, uh, the fund, we had been doing everything on a one-off basis, either for a portfolio or syndicate with our retail investor base. Um, and we, we built an incredible track record and I share, you know, you guys are aware and share our track record and deck with you and with our investors, but we really outperformed on all of our deals, being really thoughtful about uh, our underwrite and our strategy as we move through these projects. So we kind of were thinking about how do we continue to grow? So one of the important things for us was to expand our investor base. So we were very, we've been able to take down and transact on deals that we liked in the market, but we had a limitation of equity check size because we had a, a, a nice size base of retail investor, but uh, it was limited. So the fund now allows us to go out and continue to raise capital and continue doing and making the investments that we were through the one-off vehicle. So this vehicle allows investors to have a, um, more of a diverse exposure to us as managers and the assets that we're acquiring, which are really multifamily value add um, with a heavy concentration in the Philly market. Um, but we will be adding some assets down in Charlotte. Um, so you get that diversity and, and it provides ongoing cash flow and depreciation. Um, and it's a, a different way to get diversity. Um, certainly what JCAM does provides even more diversity because they're not only investing with sponsors and groups like us, they're working with multiple sponsors. So you get different managers, different um, geographic footprint. So, you know, it's nice to have that diversity when you're coming in as an investor. And that's why we launched uh, this to continue um, doing what we've been doing in the market. Makes sense, Dave. Thanks a lot for sharing. Um, yep. So let's, let's get into a little bit more meat on the, the what and why multifamily. Um, so Jack, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, the multifamily uh, as an asset class here. Uh, sure. So, you know, I've been, uh, you know, doing these deals first as a passive investor myself. So, uh, you know, I've been in the seat of a lot of the, you know, people listening into the webinar here. And, um, you know, generally there's three classes. There's, uh, you know, there's class A, which is the higher end, you know, generally newer construction, very, uh, um, you know, sometimes luxury amenities. And then there's class C, which is generally uh, much older bit buildings, maybe in economically depressed areas, uh, you know, very basic no amenities. And then you know, the, the class that I think is the perfect balance is, is class B, um, sometimes referred to as workforce housing. And, um, you know, these buildings are, are generally relatively stable, most of the time close to fully occupied, but, uh, you know, often they're just getting a little bit dated and the current ownership is not um, not managing them as efficiently and not uh, spending the money to, you know, to upkeep or improve the units. Uh, happens a lot with family owned buildings, which are a great target where um, they're just not professionally managed uh, 
um, you know, the way, you know, the way that our, our sponsors and team members would, uh, would manage them. And, um, you know, given where cap rates are and, um, you know, just the returns on these, these buildings, if you're able to increase rent by a hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a year across 50 to a hundred units, um, you know, you could raise the value of the building by, by millions of dollars. And that's not, uh, appreciation. That's a gamble. That's forced appreciation that, um, you know, that you're, that you're creating. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, it's a very much a sweet spot. Um, you know, the assets that we're in, you know, during COVID have all also performed exceedingly well. And, uh, you know, second, I'm, I'm, you know, David could talk about the experience they've had on their, their, their own portfolio, but, uh, you know, the class B is generally people, you know, we're, we're still employed. Um, some of them are essential workers. Um, you know, the, the class A buildings, people, you know, t tended to maybe get squeezed and then downsized to class B. And then in good economic times, people may upgrade from class C to class B. So I think it's a very safe recession resistant uh, area to uh, to invest in that should continue to yield uh, solid returns. Yeah, that's a great point, Jack. Um, you know, the class B is really, um, you know, risk, um, risk adverse in that whatever the market cycle people are moving or there's always de a demand for for class b so you know in a recession people are moving out of class a into class b and people you know if people are moving out of class b into class c uh, and then vice versa in, in economic booms when people are doing really well they're moving up from class c into class b and class b into class a so being in the middle there um, creates uh, consistent demand regardless of the market cycle um, and we've seen, you know, with COVID, uh, a massive migration out of metro areas into these secondary marketplaces where a lot of the Class B uh, type properties are. So another factor yet again in, in, in increasing demand for, for Class B. So why don't we jump into, um, you know, what the typical multifamily value add looks like. Jack, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, you know, I alluded to, uh, you know, uh, a building that's stabilized, but not necessarily been, uh, you know, been improved in recent years. So um, most of these deals are, are vintage in the 1970s to, uh, you know, to mid 80s, um, you know, generally, you know, perfectly livable, but uh, the, the you're not getting premium rents because the current ownership is just not uh, taking the steps to, to maximize, uh, maximize the value and, you uh, uh, of, of the property. So, you know, typically we're looking at kitchen, bathroom remodels, um, you know, maybe anywhere between three and 10,000 per unit, probably at 10,000 on the high end. David, I don't know, do, do you, is that about your range or? Uh, it, depends on the, it depends on the asset and the location. I mean, it can go significantly higher in a full reno on a unit, but for, um, for just doing like cabinets and countertops and paint that's kind of a very uh, good place and you know again when we play b a minus but um depending on the asset and what quality of finishes you're putting in but i think you're you're kind of right in that sweet spot there great and then uh, the other part of it is just finding other efficiencies in addition to upgrading the units uh often there's other uh, other revenue options available um you know improving the outdoor amenities adding uh, you know adding a gym um, in some cases, the the uh, the model apartment may not be the best apartment to make the model apartment. So, um, you know, there's been situations where they you know they, they put the model into a studio or into just you know move, move the rental office out of a two bedroom apartment that uh, you know should be on the rent roll. Um, and then there's various other uh, items and efficiencies just with the management, the software, um, you know, bundling insurance, uh, um, adjusting the utilities. Um, and we've seen many case studies where, where uh, the, the current utilities are just, uh, you know, majorly inefficient. Um, there's a, I, I saw this was not a property we were invested in, but uh, a case study on a property in New York where the heat and the air conditioning were both running all year round and fighting each other uh, to, to keep the temperature stable. And uh, they were able to lower their bill by tens of thousands of dollars. What, yeah. One of the other things that's unique that people don't always give thought to is so if you're doing a renovation, um, the scheduling for the renovation, when you take units offline and when you 
you go ahead and, and make those improvements. So understanding leasing velocity in a specific marketplace, meaning when is it most optimal to find new tenants. Um, so you want to stagger your improvements to um, upkeep cash flow and be thoughtful about that. Um, I, I kind of, if I can make one analogy with, um, with value add, um, it's in a lot of ways, it's kind of like chess. It's, a, it's an exciting game if you're into it and there's a lot of different ways you can, you can go about playing the game and you, you set out a strategy about how to do it, but value add also comes about how you behave and act during the middle of a game. So, you know, when you're playing chess, you may have a strategy of how you're gonna, you know, try to win against your opponent, but you have somebody on the other side who is working against you. In real estate, it's not that you have someone working against you, but life happens. Things change, the market changes, rents change. And so you have to be very on top of the asset understanding what kind of pricing differences you're seeing in the market and sometimes it's these little things and just being ultra efficient that really bring more revenue to the bottom line outside of the core stuff that's really easy to understand which is like hey i'm going to put a new kitchen and bathroom in and i'm going to get x rent but so those you know making sure that you have that strategy and then being able to look at the board and look at your asset on a regular basis and how you can move and make changes whether it's you know seeing the demand from types of tenants that are coming in uh i know there's an odd one but like that have dogs and you want to build a dog park or you have a higher tenant base in an urban area and you think that they might be willing to pay for a service for garbage valet where they pick up your garbage at your door and take it to the thing so there's a lot of creative ways um, and really you have to understand what your tenants want, what the market's doing. And, and it's an exciting thing um, as far as finding opportunity in each, yeah. each asset. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about some case studies where, where you implemented some, some of those different, more advanced um, strategies, Dave. Yeah, so... Um, I think we're going to kick off. We have three examples that we're going to go through in terms of value add. The first one is going to touch on kind of like in the middle of a game, a problem comes about and then turning that into a win for the asset for you and for your investors. So um, we have a project down. We're very active, as I mentioned earlier, down in North Carolina. Um, we had um, we have a multifamily on the west side, not far outside of the center area of Charlotte. Um, and we had an in-unit fire um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, we had to address the issue. There was damage. Thankfully, it wasn't much worse, but we, we brought in, uh, we brought in um, an adjuster right away that we've worked with in the past. He was able to quickly, um, you know, get that resolved. In the meantime, we had enough capital to move the improvement forward. Uh, um, in the end, we certainly wound up with a much better unit and we, we got our top uh, rents. Uh, we got the highest rent level for this unit, um, but there's a bigger story behind this. And that, that rent also is helping us to push some other rents in the complex. But uh, to break down some numbers, the, um, the total proceeds we got on the insurance was $50,000. Net of the in-unit renovation, we were left with actually about $16,000 which we could have distributed in cash flow to our investors. Um, and we had other cash flow sitting on the side, but the asset had been performing well. Um, and when I say well, we had planned on doing a lot more reno. We were able to come in and effectuate rental increases to, on our, our year two pro forma in year one without doing the renos, just by pushing rents up. So we had excess capital. We wound up taking that extra Sixteen thousand uh, dollars, in addition to another twelve thousand dollars for an investment into a water billback program. So every investment you make within the asset should be looked at on an analysis. So we were theoretically making twelve thousand dollar investment because that was the delta between the proceeds from the insurance company and what we um, what the total project was. So that that investment was huge for us because on an annual basis, that equated to $32,400 in net operating income at the bottom 
at the bottom line. That's a significant amount of uh, increase. And this was a smaller project for us. It was 55 units. It was a five million and change acquisition. But that $32,000 investment um, at a cap rate that we are kind of seeing in that, that marketplace for this level of asset is a five cap, and it may even be a little more aggressive, but at that cap rate, that increased revenue from our decision to build back water, which was a $12,000 extra investment, brought market value of another $714,000 to the valuation of the property, which is massive. Um, and it kind of talked about like to what Jack was saying, like a small increase because these assets trade on a multiple can be a huge win for you and your investors at the end. So I like this story and we have lots of them. We're going to touch on two others, but this one's unique in that it was not part of our strategy originally. And we saw this opportunity and we realized the income that we could bring by making this move. Um, so not only does the cash flow move up, but the valuation moves up. Yeah. Uh, and so, you had the wherewithal to, to recognize that as an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next one I'll touch on is like maybe historically the best deal we did or may ever do. Uh, I don't want to go that far and say it, but this is, this is, um, a really unique value add um, and a very difficult deal that a lot of other operators could not have come in and done. And I think our background and the capital that we had had from our funding company and the way we structured that, we came across a deal that we've been circling for over a year. It was a broken condo project in New Jersey. Uh, the original sponsor converted an old garden style apartment to multi. Um, they, they wound up, you know, when the market turned, things went bad back in 07. Um, the guy defaulted, the asset, the note got traded, and um, a large institutional uh, uh, investment bank wound up holding the paper, eventually foreclosed. And they, they're not an asset manager, they're not actively operators. And so this was just a drain on their balance sheet and it was a, it was through a fund vehicle. So they had to get this off. This asset was trading. Um, one bedrooms were selling on the open market for only 110,000 a door, which is dirt cheap in Monmouth County in New Jersey. But the problem was nobody could get financing because um, the association was in a really, really bad situation. It was starting to get better because the investor that, that took over these units started making the payments for the condo association. So it was starting to be brought back to health, but they needed to get it off their books. So we acquired this asset for 55,000 a door, which was 50 cents on the dollar for what they were trading for. But we saw a much bigger picture than the 50 cents on the dollar, um, which was, we felt and we we can we we hired the top uh, um, condo association attorney in New Jersey who helped write some of the legislation on it and we came in and we took over the board but we and 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 were able to get um, you know the, the association back in a better place but we were looking and we're gonna use a bank to finance the deal and they couldn't discount our equity check for the you know the discount that we were picking up the property at at 50 cents on the dollar and so what happened was they were looking for us to bring 30 percent equity and you know we said why don't we we have an insurance company that we've done a lot of business with in our in a, in in our funding company and they came in and backed us and gave us a bridge loan so they gave us 90 percent of the acquisition and 100 percent of our reno costs um, at a 10% coupon, we paid 10%. It sounds like a lot, but we were able to exit that in th in three months with a um, with another like traditional lender that we had a relationship with. But what we did was we actually wound up going into the deal with almost no money down because we were able to take nine of the units of the 62 and package them and sell them off to another investor investment group that we were going to manage. We marked those up 30,000 a unit, which was still a big discount to retail. We wound up um, using the proceeds from that as the majority of our down payment. 
So we were able to get into this deal with like 3% of our own money. The rest came from this, this sell-off. So we wound up taking over um, the project. We first attacked the investor pool and we renovated those units um, and we started releasing them to market. Um, and simultaneously, we got in a loan for the HOA that helped uh, resolve some other ongoing issues that were there and then allowed us to get Fannie Mae uh, for, um, for FHA approval so people could start getting mortgages and open the market up to, to other buyers. So we continued to renovate the complex while we were doing improvements in our units. And the last piece I'll say is that what we did was you can't move prices up dramatically because people that are getting mortgages need an appraisal and the, and the appraisers need to comp out other sales. So we strategically started increasing the level of finishes in the unit and releasing them in stages. The investor pool wound up making a 1.7 multiple in two years. We wound up keeping the rest of the asset and selling that at, um, selling down units. The last one bedroom that we sold, we sold for 175,000 with a only a, a $18,000 capital expenditure in that unit. So it was a massive win. We sold off and now have 27 units that we own free and clear that generate strong cash flow. So it was a complete co complex deal because it was predicated on us taking over the board um, and and it also you know meant like creating this deal structure so um very unique and it's value add on multiple levels but that deal structure created a massive windfall for us and for that investor pool um so i you know um and then the last one that i'll touch on um you had mentioned at the beginning that uh it's a, a hotel conversion to apartments. It hasn't been executed as of yet. Um, we're under contract and in, um, uh, we're actually, uh, I'll, let me go back to the deal. This project exists in the research triangle outside west of Charlotte. Uh, it's a very, a large, an area that's got um, great economic foundation, a lot of growth. There's a strong demand for additional housing. This hotel operator needed to get out. As you can imagine with COVID, things were, were, were um, stressed. We're coming in and um, buying this asset for $8.3 million. It's a 96 unit long-term stay Marriott Hotel. Um, the owner is gonna deflag it for us and they gave us time to get the approvals to convert. We hired the one of the top land use attorneys in Charlotte. Um, and we did some pre due diligence to make sure that this would be acceptable in, in general um, to the to the city. And we've already had some discussions pre our hearing about what they're going to want us to do, which fits into our business plan. Um, but we're pretty confident that we get the approval and we're going to take this um, uh, hotel and convert it. We're planning. We already had our contractors through um and we're gonna make you know kind of de-hotel the field in the lobby area um create this you know business center there's already a gym and a pool um and we're gonna dress up some of the outside and change a little bit of it our total capital improvements on it will be two million dollars uh plus or minus it comes out to about uh twenty five thousand a unit for uh for all the improvements but we believe that our total all in dollars will fall somewhere around 10.5, 10.7 10 million dollars. And we think that uh, very conservatively that we will be able to turn that around and be north of 12 and a half million. Um, we're looking at an IRR in this project of, you know, upper 20% range. And we think there's a lot more upside in it, but we try to be conservative. So we. We're lining up our plan with, um, you know, materials and things like that while we're working on on, on the uh, development. So, uh, very different types of value add. Again, my my thoughts are that, you know, sometimes it's not the the normal piece. It's about how you schedule improvements or how you structure your deal or what type of financing you put on the deal. 
or when and how you plan to exit. If you see an opportunity that there's some, there's some uh, velocity in the market, you may have had a plan to hold and maybe it's an opportunity to sell and redeploy those cap the capital into a lower basis. So um, I know I go on and get really excited about talking about this topic, but <laughs> as Jack said, to finish out on my end here is that, you know, a value add strategy is not dependent on market appreciation. It's dependent on your ability to find the opportunity and execute on it. And if you're really good at it, you know, there's always going to be really good, good opportunities out in the market. So we, we, we focus our efforts in specific areas where we think the underlying economics uh, and, and the market is strong and that we're able to build and, and develop strong resources. So, um, you know, think outside the box when you're looking at value add um, and, you know, hopefully those examples were, were helpful. Yeah, David, thanks. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what you said there, you know, you, you do have to be really flexible um, and then be able to recognize those opportunities. And obviously with your experience um, in the asset class and then, you know, just your, your background, you know, it, it's pretty clear that you have the experience as an operator, um, you know, to really take advantage of those those opportunities and and make, you know, lemonade out of lemons um so thanks a lot for sharing why don't we transition to um to the jcam diversified real estate fund and kind of how that correlates to the conversation today um jack did you want to talk a little bit about uh the fund specifically uh sure so this was uh you know this fund launched in uh, september of this year and um, you know the target raise is, is $15 million. Uh, so far, we've raised uh, just a bit under 2.5 million, and uh, we've uh, uh, made investments into five different multifamily Class B assets, um, including uh, Augusta, Georgia is 104 units, uh, Phoenix, Arizona is 288, uh, uh, Jacksonville is 286. Um, there's a two building package next door to each other in Atlanta, um, Georgia, and then actually coincidentally, Greenville, uh, South Carolina, not too far from uh, from, from David's hotel. Um, and we're actively uh, rounding out our raise for a 314 units in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, that's a great property. There's an indoor pool, um, actually in that photo behind the, behind you, you can see kind of in the distance that that glass enclosure is an in indoor heated pool. Um, all six of these are run by different management team sponsors. Um, so we're in different markets with uh, a diverse set of very experienced managers. And, um, you know, we will uh, likely be adding, uh, you know, adding uh, properties in the future. Uh, if, if David has room on, uh, on that hotel deal uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Gre Greenville, we'll, we'll definitely be, uh, be interested. And yeah. uh, in addition to the multifamily, we do also we did also uh, make a, a, a deeply discounted acquisition on a portfolio of 22 uh, uh, what were originally foreclosed properties. Uh, however, many of them are set up with uh, with rent to own contracts in them, and uh, you know that that's that's a project that's likely to be a 30 percent plus return. So it was a strategic acquisition. Um, Roughly half the fund is going to be exactly what you see on this this page here. Um, this multifamily value add, um, and then uh, rounding out the fund will be these opportunistic deals um, like the the portfolio of REOs. Uh, we also uh, are uh, going to fund a senior living ground up uh, project, uh, making a small allocation uh, because there is a there is a major housing shortage both in senior living and also just for residential. So. Um, selectively, we'll combine the cash flow of the assets you see on this sheet with uh, certain certain uh, projects that have much higher upside. So you have cash flow and upside and diversification. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we, we we covered the uh, the basics of what the fund already holds so far. Um, we do have a fixed return share class as well for those that are looking for more of a fixed return. Uh, however, the equity share classes are either six or eight percent depending on uh, the minimum investment. And uh, you know, pays preferred returns quarterly, and we're targeting uh, targeting a conservative fifteen percent uh, overall fund return. 
and um, yeah, that's uh, that's the basics of the of the fund. Yeah, One, so I would you just don't... add. Oh, yeah, sorry. Have... I, I would just add that you know, David's group is is a great example of the type of operator or sponsor that that we. Uh, want to participate with just based on the, the level of experience and expertise. So, um. I, I was going to just um, add a little something to 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 the JCAM and and what you guys are doing. And um, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of people don't have exposure to real estate because um, many times real estate is not offered through your typical financial services where most people go or, or lean on to figure out where to put their dollars to work. Um, but without sounding corny or cliche, you know, you know, the biggest wealth for most of you know people throughout history has been through real estate. And and you know, even you know, from financial advisors to other folks will uh, you know, there's some traditional thought somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of your portfolio should be through real estate and what's really good you know with uh, dot frank that happened a few years ago and some of the regulations with securities offerings is now opening the door for other folks to get exposure through groups like jcam who do a great job creating a diverse real estate portfolio um you know ourselves which create our own diverse real estate portfolio but you know, it's sometimes intimidating because people don't understand how you get involved and it's not something that's as mainstream, but that doesn't mean it's not a secure investment that provides great returns. You know, finding good operators or, or operators that are uh, capital allocators like, like Jack um, and William are a great way to get exposure and, and it, it provides ongoing cash flow and tax benefits that you don't really get from other investments and people don't understand the depth of it. And I know I would, and I know for sure Jack and William would always welcome a discussion to explain that and help educate. Um, but, you know, having diversity in anything, be it equity market or real estate is important. And, and this is a, an avenue that you can look at. Yeah, absolutely, David, thank you for sharing. So for those of you guys who have more questions about uh, JCAM and the offering, you can visit jcaminvestments.com backslash offerings um, to view more details there. Uh, if you want to connect with any of us, if you have any, you know, any follow up feedback, questions or concerns, um, our email or contact information is here. Um, I did have a question uh, asked by one of our guests um, if the video uh, will be recorded and, and uh, able to share. Uh, so we are recording this and if you're attending, you're going to get a, a follow-up email uh, with the recording there. So if you want to, if you didn't have a chance to stay on uh, the full time with us today, you can review it later. If, you're, uh, if you didn't see it at all, you can review it at a later date as well. It'll be on our website as well. So um, that's going to wrap it up unless David or Jack, you have anything else you want to talk about? No, um, good. <laughs> I, I would just say thank you uh, for putting this together and uh, always enjoy talking real estate and, um, yeah. you know, you, I, I know, like I said, Jack very well. He's an amazing guy and great, you know, operator, not so good at golf, but <laughs> we won't hold that against him. But I want to thank you guys and, and really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, share some of our stories and info about Lucerne Capital and the investments that we make and the opportunities that we have direct. Yeah. Yeah, David, David thank you so much for, for sharing your, your, your story and, and uh, some of your uh, successful deals. And, uh, you know, I know, uh, I know you're going to be a big part of our, our fund's future. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to show, uh, you know, show our communities, uh, you know, the, the caliber of, uh, of operators that, uh, you know, that we seek to partner with, uh, on uh, upcoming real estate deals. Awesome. All right, gentlemen and guests, thank you all for joining us and probably going to do this again in two weeks, Thursday. So uh, if you have any feedback on topics that you want us to talk about, uh, we'd love to hear from you on that. Otherwise, uh, have a great day and we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Take care.